when you think back into history, there has never been a nation that has completely followed God and his, and his word and his practices and his ways 100%, not even 50%. When you look back into biblical history, the first generation that crossed into the promised land with Joshua, with Joshua followed the Lord. When that generation died and following generations, the Bible said in the book of Judges that everyone did what is right in his own eyes. You come down to modern history. Um, America was founded on biblical principles. By the founding fathers uh, prayed uh, when they were put together the Constitution. George Washington prayed uh, during the, the American War of Independence. That's why we were able to drive the tyrannical Br uh, British out of the colonies. In Europe, um, after the Reformation and things settled down, uh, they started with the age of reason and they kicked God out of the equation. Men like Voltaire and, and those, the, those sorts uh, were trying to stamp out Christianity. The great, uh, the great men like John Wesley, George Whitfield, Charles, Charles uh, Spurgeon all came out of Great Britain, England. But England is now about uh, 3 to 5 percent Christian. Um, in the 1700s, when, when uh, Wesley was in his heyday and, and, when, and when the Great Awakening started, the first Great Awakening started in the United States, uh, England was a cesspool of corruption, perversion, uh, and gambling, and that, and that was just in the church, the Church of England. So, how do we pray for a nation to write its course? Now, we many of us have been praying for a great awakening, a revival, and for for decades and decades. And I've been in a, in a pocket of revival here and there, where you see like an entire county transformed, or or city, or community. But how about on a national level? The pandemic uh, we, we have been going through and have just gone through in, in, in certain parts of, uh, of the nation, usually it is the southern part of the nation where uh, things are coming back to normal, um, gave us an opportunity to stay in and to, and to bear down and, and get into the Word of God and fellowship with our, with our families and our church brothers and sisters, and even those who are interested but do not know Him yet. Um, how do we pray for, uh, for a nation to repent when they don't know what repentance is, when they don't know they've sinned, when they don't even care that they've sinned? Well, as, as men and women of God, we should care. And we should also uh, bear down on God's word and stay on our knees until the Lord calls us home and we have accomplished uh, the task that he sent us here for. Because everyone has a calling on his life. Uh, not necessarily to be a missionary or a preacher or anything, but we have a calling to do what we can. And, and the easiest thing we can do as men and women of God is to pray for our nation, uh, which has gone astray, and uh, especially the Western world, which has turned from the one true God of the Bible. Uh, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 7, verse 14 is used a lot by, by many of us in the prayer movement. But today we're going to look at a prayer of Ezra, uh, when, when he had, uh, when the, the Israelites had come back from Babylonian exile and had sinned in the sight of God by marrying not foreign women in the sense of women from another country, but foreign as in gods. You cannot mix God with, with paganism. You cannot mix the God of this world uh, with people from other religions and then expect not to corrupt. That The reason why God sent the Israelites into, Bab into Babylon is because of Solomon. It started all the way back with Solomon when he uh, started marrying, for political reasons, pagan women from Egypt and all the other nations surrounding Israel and corrupted uh, the people of, of, of Israel until the, the kingdom split. And, he, and Solomon himself worshipped pagan gods until he repented at the end and wrote the book of Ecclesiastes and got himself right with God. Unfortunately, it was too late for his own sons uh, who had already gone off in, on their own uh, deep end and, and are now paying the price of eternal separation from God. So, in Second Chronicles, 
that's on the side there. Uh, verse 14, uh, Solomon is praying here, and, and God is, is telling him, uh, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, before he said this, Solomon was praying. And Solomon, this, uh, this is before he went off to, uh, into his own fleshly lust and, and started worshiping pagan gods. He was actually, uh, he built the temple and he dedicated it and he was praying. Now, so let's read this in context now. Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house he successfully accomplished. Then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night and said to him, I have heard your prayer. And if we pray, having done the work that God has called us to do, and if we pray and, and submit ourselves to the will of God, he will hear, for, he will hear us, our prayers and he will, and he will respond. So, Son, so the Lord responded to Solomon, I have heard your prayer and chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. And there's a pestilence right now, and it's not just a virus. It's a pestilence of sin and a sin that, uh, that has started um, among the people, the people of God, uh, political leaders, governors, uh, leaders, mayors, uh, e even some uh, church leaders. There's a pestilence of sin among my people, if my people. Now, that's the context there. Uh, uh, bad things are going to happen, but if we, are God's people, are, who are called by his name, humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and turn from our wicked ways, there, there's, there are three actions here that we need to do as people of God. Humble ourselves before him. That means realize that he is God and we're not and we're sinners. And pray. So humble, pray, and seek. And turn. So there's four things, actually. Humble, pray, seek, and turn, repent from our wicked ways, then he will hear from heaven and forgive our sin. So now we go to the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra, Ezra is, is, is a great man of God. He came back from the Babylonian exile, and, and Zerubbabel had rebuilt the temple. This is about 526, 536 B.C., uh, and um, Nehemiah had already built the wall in 51 days, I think. And uh, God pointed out a sin that the people who had come back from, uh, from exile had got a little too lax there and forgotten the commands of God to not intermarry with people from pagan religions, not races, pagan religions. And that's why the Bible tells us in the book in the New Testament, we should not be equal, unequally yoked. This is why a Christian young man or young woman should marry another Christian, a young man or young woman. So, chapter 9 of, is, of Ezra gives us a powerful prayer of repentance that we should uh, claim as our own and as, as we pray for our nation, as we pray for our communities, as we pray for our families, as we pray for our children, as we pray for our military, as we pray for law enforcement and first responders, and now medical personnel who are on the front lines uh, during pandemics, and everything else that is our businesses that that keeps all of this afloat. Now politicians uh, like to have, anyway. Let's not, let's not get into politics right now. Um. So. In the context of Ezra chapter 9, he has now found out the big sin and the violation of God's law that uh, it had been uh, talked about here. And in verse 3, we see, As soon as he heard this, Ezra is speaking now, I tore my garment and my cloak and pulled my hair from my head and beard and sat appalled. He had heard that God's people were intermarrying with people from the, the, the Canaanites and all the other ites, Jebusites, everybody around him, that God had told them to stay away from because he knew what was going to happen. It happened to Solomon. That's how they ended up in the Babylonian exile. They were worshiping pagan gods and, and sacrificing their own children to Moloch, which is a, a 
form of abortion by itself. Infanticide. So he heard about this. And as a man of God, and we as people of God, should be appalled at what we're seeing today um, with everything around us and, and, and persecution of our brothers and sisters in China and other places, but especially China now, where they're bulldozing churches and arresting pastors for having services online, cutting their te telephones, uh, uh, busting in their houses and, and arresting them and putting them in concentration camps. This is happening right now in China, which will be in, in, the, uh, in the near future the, the biggest persecutor of Christians. Then verse 4, Then all who trembled at the words of the Lord of God of Israel because of the faithlessness, the faithlessness of the returning exiles who have not learned their lesson yet, gathered around me while I sat appalled until the evening sacrifice. Now the evening sacrifice was, was, was uh, prescribed in the book of the law in the Leviticus and uh, it was supposed to be a morning and evening sacrifice and prayer unto, unto Almighty God. And at the evening sacrifice, I rose from my fasting with my garment and cloak and fell upon my knees and spread out my hands to the Lord my God, saying, Now here he is. He heard, he heard about the big sin and violation against God's law from, uh, from, the, from earlier on, which was given to Moses by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he fell down on his knees and he spread his hands before God. Oh, that we would have that sort of uh, a pain and anguish uh, for the sin, not just of our people, but for our own sin and for those of our families. And here's what Ezra prayed. Ezra prayed, Oh my God, I am ashamed and blush to lift my face to you, my God. For my iniquities, for our iniquities, have risen higher than, all, higher than our heads. Iniquities, now, sin is just missing the park. Iniquity is one step beyond across the line. And transgression is complete rebellion against God. When King David had uh, lusted after Bathsheba, had committed adultery, and broke the chain of the Ten Commandments, because when you, once you break one, you break all, and then have uh, her husband Uriah the Hittite killed, he had violated every commandment in, in, the, in the, of the Ten Commandments. He had sinned against God. He had basically thumbed his nose against God. And then he had uh, put himself as an uh, and, and, his, and his own desires as an idol before God and his word. And, and that kind of rebellion where you willingly go against everything that you know is right and thumb your nose against God is, is transgression. Next down is iniquities, where you just, uh, you don't care anyway, and you're just going to do it, and, but still call yourself a, a, a Christian or, or a child of God. And, he, and so he is now a, crying out before God and admitting that they, not him personally, because he had just found out what they had done and the iniquity is now as higher than he, even he could imagine. And then he said their guilt has mounted up to the heavens. And now God had, uh, had set that to, to be revealed to him, knowing that he as a man of God will pray. And if you read, uh, uh, we will probably won't have time to get into it in, uh, today, but if you read chapter 10 of Ezra, you will see that the people listened after they had heard Ezra cry out to God like this, in this massive prayer here in uh, chapter 9. So he admitted his, uh, the sins of the people that he had found, just found out and that it was a vile and foul sin uh, uh, as a disgusting odor in the nostrils of the Lord. Verse 7, From the days of our fathers to this day, we have been in great guilt. And if you think about what happened when, uh, when God had freed the, the, the Israelites from Egypt, brought them which is a picture of salvation, across the Red Sea on dry land and in the desert, and they were heading towards the promised land, how they sinned, how they worshipped golden calves, how they were so impatient and greedy and lustful that they turned from the one God who rescued them and turned to evil pagan gods and lust and drunkenness and orgies and turned against him 
And that guilt was just as wild or even worse than what they were doing here. And they have a history of that. That's how they ended up in Babylon, sinning against God. Now, God sent Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to wipe out Jerusalem and, and put it, burn it to the ground because he had to cleanse that city of that vile, uh, that vile sin of, of paganism, of pagan worship. And think about what God's going to do one of these days because the, the book of Revelation tells us what's coming after the rapture of the church and, and, and Christians are taken out of here because there's, uh, there's going to be a seven, year of, seven years of tribulation and it's not going to be easy because um, if you read the book of Revelation, what's coming to those who have disobeyed God, who are not saved uh, and know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, it, 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 it should put the scare of God into you and then bring you to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. So, from the days of our fathers to this day, to this day, we have been in great guilt. And for our iniquities, we, our kings, our priests, because the priests, the religious leaders, were just as corrupt as, some, as the leaders themselves, have been given into the hands of the kings of lands to the sword, to captivity, to plundering, and to utter shame. Because of the sins of the people, God had given them over to, to pagan... Uh, to pagan, vile pagan people like Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan at the time until he got saved, and 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 they were they were basically destroyed physically, and they were sent out into exile. Verse eight. But now. He realizes that even with all that guilt, and we should realize that now, even with what uh, our our country has done, our 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 world has done, even with. Uh, bowing down to the cult gods of the culture, of, of, of the community, of putting everything else above God, of putting sports above God, of putting uh, even our families as beautiful as they are and, and, as, and as wonderful as, um, as we are supposed to minister to them. Even if we put those above God, we are putting idols before the will of God. And God but God still is so gracious. He's full of love, compassion, and mercy that he, uh, Ezra says here, for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us as a remnant. God gives his grace to the humble. Remember the passage I read as at the beginning, if my people will humble themselves, pray, seek, and turn. Four things. God has given this uh, Ezra an another chance here, and he gives us chances after chances uh, that, that, so that we can uh, come to him and just and, and just worship him in, uh, in spirit and in truth. Up for a brief moment, favor has been shown by the Lord our God to leave us to the remnant and to give us a secure hold with his holy place. In other words, to bring us, uh, bring us back into the fold. If, if we would pray for, uh, for communities and our, and, our, and our people to turn from their wicked ways and, and, and to seek the face of the Lord, he will bring us into his holy place. He will, he will show favors to, favor to us and, and, he, and, and give us more, even more grace, give us revival. That our God may brighten our eyes and grant us a little reviving in our slavery. You know, um, before we were rescued from, from our own selves, from, from the dominion of darkness and, and brought into the kingdom of his marvelous light, as, as the book of Colossians says, we were slaves to sin. We're living in darkness, the people. But when we, we, we found Christ, when Christ found us, actually, and, and opened our eyes and, and freed us from the bondage of sin and, and, re, and rejuvenated us and turned us from our wicked ways and, and we were born again, the people walking in darkness saw a great light. And here Ezra is acknowledges, acknowledging that we have that opportunity here and, and then now as well. Because God does not change. The, the will of God has not changed over the, over the, the, the millennia. He's, he's given us this book for us to live and to come into a saving knowledge of him until the end of time when all will be judged and then we will take it from there. But he's given us that time now for little reviving and, bond and freedom and setting the captives free from our slavery, from our sin from our social diseases, from a from a from a mindset of, of of conformity to this world when he wants us to be transformed by his word into the renewal of our mind. 
Verse 9, for we are slaves. We are slaves. Not, uh, we might be slaves under the, the rules of, uh, of certain leaders, but in, in, the, in countries around the world, but we're actually slaves to sin and, and, the, and, and, the, and the parameters that the world has placed uh, from the time the, uh, the sin entered the garden in Genesis 3 until now. But when Christ sets us free, he, he raises us above that sin and, and he gives us a, um, an inheritance in an eternal kingdom for eternity, past, present, and future that we can see into the future now and we can see things in the word, in the word because the Holy Spirit will be opening our minds for we are slaves, yet God has not forsaken us. God has not forsaken us. He keeps giving us chance after chance until we actually repent and come to him. But God has not forgiven us in our slavery, but has extended his steadfast love before the kings of Persia. And God is extending his love right now. He's given us one more chance. And then after we blow that, he's going to give us another chance. But one day, the chances are going to run out. How about now? How about if, if personally between you and God? If you do not know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, now is the time to make things right with him. Now is the hour of redemption. Uh, confess us, your sins and my sins. Ask God to forgive you. There's no sin that you cannot, that you have done that God cannot forgive. He cannot forgive. Ask him to forgive you and believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess it with your mouth and ask him to be the Lord of your life. He's given us that chance now. Don't put it off. He's extended a steadfast love. His steadfast love is love that never changes. God so loved the world. Remember that. He, so to grant us some reviving, to set up the house of our God, to repair our ruins, and to give us protection in Judea and Jerusalem. And God is going to watch over us, his people now, if we come to him and, and honor him. And now, O oh God, what shall we say? For we have forsaken your commandments. So, Remember now, in, in, when he began this prayer, he admitted the sin of the people. So when, when we come to pray for our nation, we admit the sins of our nations and, uh, and not just um, ignoring the word of God and putting other things above God, but also things like abortion, things like uh, not protecting the unborn, not protecting senior citizens, not protecting our children's minds from, uh, the, from the evil out there, not protecting our own souls and guarding our own hearts. So and then, but then, as he as he uh, repented of the sins of the people, he, he he recalls now that God is a gracious God, and that he, he loves his love is so steadfast that he gives another chance, and then he um, he's given a, t a chance of reviving, if we just come to him, and God Himself says so in Second Chronicles seven fourteen. So then, he he goes through the rest of this prayer all the way down to. Uh, let's say verse 14b. So we want to skip down from verse 9 to 14b. And there he says, Now, no, acknowledging that God is a God of graciousness, love, and compassion, he says, Shall we break your commandments again and intermarry with the people who practice these abominations? Shall we as people in, in 20, 2020 and beyond, uh, knowing this truth and knowing that God has forgiven us and knowing that God has set... Uh, the, the path before us for, for revival, are we going to keep following the ways of this world and, and, and supporting this, this evil culture and, and the mindset and, and evolution and abortion and all that stuff? Are we going to keep doing that? that that's what he's saying here. Would you, not, would you not be angry with us until you consume us so that there should be no remnant nor any escape? O oh Lord, the God of Israel, you are just. God is a just God. For we, are, for we are left a remnant that has escaped, as is today. Behold, we are before you in our guilt, for none can stand before you, before you because of this. None can stand before you because of this. Um, I'd like to take us now to Hosea chapter 6. Because if we repent, if we're seeking revival like this, if, if we acknowledge now our sin, acknowledge that God has given us another chance to revive, and has and have come and say, Lord, help us to to just turn from this, and to and and to and to not follow this way again, but to come to you. Here, here's a prayer that we can pray now, as we finish this uh, this short message on on praying for uh, corporate prayer for for our leaders and for our people, 
and for people in general in our community and in, the, in our own families, here's what the prophet Hosea had come to, uh, to the Lord and said. Come, let us return to the Lord. Uh, Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 and 2 and 3. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us that he may heal us. Now, when we have repented, he tears away uh, all, not just the garments that as Ezra had ripped up, he tears away all, all the sins of our flesh, and he exposes us. And then we, we see that, and then we, we ask God to heal us and, and protect us. And now, uh, so we do not turn from that, turn towards that again. He has struck us down and will bind us up. After two days, he will revive us, and on the third day, he, he will raise us up that we may live before him. Let us know. Let us press on to know the Lord. His going out is as sure as the dawn. He will come to us as the showers, as the spring rains that water the earth. So what he's saying here is, come, let us return to the Lord. Because Ezra had recognized the sins of the people, had confessed, had ripped uh, his, his, not just his garments, but his hearts open, and God had seen um, and forgiven. And Ezra had, and now, and at the end of the, uh, chapter 9, Ezra had said, when we should not be breaking the commandments of God again. If, if we follow scripture to this, this verse right here, let us return to the Lord. That should be the response. We pray now for our, for our, in, in, to our country to return to the Lord because we need to know him. We need to press on into him because he will come to us as the showers and as the spring rains that water the earth. This may sound like a, a confusing prayer. It is not. It flows. It flows from God recognizing that we are going to sin. Ezra, and then he shows us how we can repent. And then he shows us how we can return to him. And he will give us some revival and bring the rain and wash off our sins and, and help us to grow again in righteousness and, and in beauty. Let's keep praying for the nation. Let's keep praying for our communities. Let's keep praying for all our peoples to come back to the Lord that there may be a revival in our hearts and in our communities and in our churches. God bless you. See you again next time. Amen.